Good evening. <laughs> Day number 10 and the last. So you've made it through. Congratulations. <laughs> You're still alive, everybody. <laughs> Good. As I was mentioning uh, tonight, tonight we'll just take it fairly easy and we can consider the, the retreat is coming to, to its end. Uh, there will be a puja tomor tomorrow morning, but it will be very, very light and it's mainly to, you know, not uh, to kind of ease into the the rest of the world and to have a, a light a morning touch it was appreciated on the other retreats so um, but um, tonight I thought as every retreat that um, I would speak perhaps or we could talk a little bit about a very important aspect of a path apparently because there was uh, this one of the suttas in the um, chapter of the path if I'm not right in the connected if I'm not wrong <laughs> in the connected discourses where the Buddha Ananda goes to the Buddha with like this realization and he says Bhante this surely is half the spiritual life this must be half of the spiritual life this good company good friendship good companionship and the Buddha says don't say that Ananda don't say that <laughs> it is the whole of the path and so, and he explains a little bit more why after, but at the end of this retreat, I think if we could summarize everything, which I'm not going to do tonight, <laughs> and mm, allow us to um, continue in the right direction or to... You know, there are so many things that we could say right now to, you know, summarize the path or all these things. But really what truly matters is this is this was a quick dip in the Dhamma. It was fairly, uh, fairly intense, perhaps for some or uh, too short for others. I don't know. But um, it's only 10 days and now we have all this life that will come again to us and uh, one of the key aspects of this is that and the Buddha often began his talks with uh, differently every time but very often with mention about who we spend time with who we choose to associate with and that is very important and to who we choose to surround ourselves with. So, the Buddha, w it, this was very uh, common uh, in, in his talks to very often he would first begin with, well, first one needs to know. If, if one wants to know the Dhamma, how to meditate, well then one needs to know people that know the Dhamma <laughs> or to be in a group where there's you know, it is the actual activity and it is the foundation or it is uh, what is being practiced promoted uh, not promoted in the sense of a maybe a company but uh, promoted in the sense of nourishing it and uh, nurturing these wonderful qualities and it's always easier and it's always so much um, supportive 
when there are other people to who we can go to and talk, share about our practice, uh, talk about our experiences, even though uh, we often talk about solitude and meditation and retreat, <laughs> being together but alone, uh, this, these kinds of friendship that um, support us in this, in our practice. And there is this wonderful sutta, which um, is called the Megiya Sutta, where Megiya is the assistant of the Buddha at that time, and uh, they're uh, in Chalika, a Chalika mountain. And they, they're they just touring uh, together, and they, they just stop there at Chalika. And, uh, this Megiya wants to, he's, he's fairly new, so he's, he hasn't, has a, doesn't have a very strong meditation background. And so he wants to go to, for alms, and then he asks the Buddha permission, and then he goes. And on his returns from alms, he, uh, he goes and explores a little bit and finds this nice, uh, this wonderful, river and then he walks up and then finds this lovely uh, mango grove and then he goes oh this this looks like a pretty pretty nice place to come and spend a day meditating so uh, he goes back to the buddha and asks him if he could go back the next day and the buddha says wait nagia until until other people come because they were alone and then he would leave the Buddha alone and uh, well all kinds of things can happen especially when traveling and all these things and monks can't do much <laughs> in the sense that um, they don't ha they can't handle money they don't well they just you know so whatever happens it's always good to <laughs> have another monk so at least you can he help each other or something like that even though you both can do much but <laughs> you can kind of support each other in not doing much <laughs> and um, but Megia is very persistent and he's saying that, no like, I really want to go and um, Bante, it's, it's easy for you, Bante, because you're awakened. <laughs> you don't have anything else to do. No, I, I'm not. I'm not awakened. Like, I still have to meditate. I still have to strive. And he wants to strive. And so he asked three times, and the Buddha says, Since you speak about striving, Megiya, just, just go. Just, just do it. <laughs> and he goes, and he goes to the mango grove, and... Obviously, his mental state at that point, he's just like, he doesn't really know how to meditate, really. He just wants, it's a good, it's a good intention that's very uh, praiseworthy. <laughs> but um, his mind, he, he doesn't really know how to meditate. So he just goes to the mango grove and he just ends up spending all day thinking about all kinds of things and anger arises and he's thinking about all these central pleasures that uh, so the story goes that Megia was also a king for 500 lifetimes so <laughs> and this <laughs> and this mango grove was a particular um, pleasure garden for him uh, in the past and so anyways so that's a a little parenthesis on the story but uh, he has all these uh, inclinations of the mind since he was a king for a long time and he was used to indulging in all these pleasures and it all comes up and so he can't meditate at all because he doesn't know how and so he goes back to the Buddha uh, thinking wow it's amazing <laughs> I, I became a monk I left everything and I can't even meditate <laughs> so that's so he's coming to some realization there and um, he goes back to the Buddha and tells him everything that he just lived that he couldn't meditate at all not even calming his mind and this is where this starts 
And the Buddha replies, when the liberation of the heart has still not yet come to maturity, Magiya, five things lead to its ripening. Here, Magiya, one has wise friends, wise company, wise companions. When the liberation of the heart has still not yet come to maturity, Magiya, this is the first thing that leads to its ripening. Further, Magiya, one is good in nature, protected and mastered by the virtues. Continually living in righteous behavior, seeing danger in the smallest lapse of attention, undertaking the training in the virtues. When the liberation of the heart has still not yet come to maturity, Magiya, this is the second thing that leads to its ripening. So very often the Buddha always uh, started uh, by saying, first, we need to practice uh, at, at the coarser level, at the coarser physical level. If we just do whatever we want, there's no point in... If, uh, if we don't practice the virtue, we don't have the condition, the, the environment for practicing mental development. And he said in many suttas, purify the very root, the very beginning of wholesome states which is everything that we do. So we always start from this. Further, Magiya, one goes and listens to discourses on the direct practice of the higher life, which leads to opening up the heart, unfailing letting go, calming down, release, appeasement, direct knowledge, and full awakening, and Nibbana. That is, talks on having few desires, keeping things simple. Talks on contentment, talks on retreating, talks on distancing <laughs> from society. Now, this is very good for now. I think everybody's practicing this nowadays. Um, social distancing. Talks on practicing wholeheartedly. Talks on virtue, talks on mental development, talks on discernment, talks on unbinding liberation, talks on seeing and experiencing unbinding. So I think we've covered all of those talks during these 10 days, or very close. Such talks one has access to at will without any trouble or obstruction. When the liberation of the heart has still not yet come to maturity, Magiya, this is the third thing that leads to its ripening. Further, Magiya, one lives determined and inspired for giving up unwholesome states of mind for the increase of wholesome ones with firm resolution and unflinching endurance in wholesome states, when the liberation of the heart has still not yet come to maturity, Magiya, this is the fourth thing that leads to its ripening. Further, Magiya, one is discerning, one is endowed with the wisdom that brings about the arising of happiness. The discernment of the Aryas that brings about the complete end of trouble. What is troublesome? And then letting it go. Happiness. When the liberation of the heart has still not yet come to maturity, Magiya, this is the fifth thing that leads to its ripening. Now here it gets interesting. Magiya... It can be expected of one with wise friends, wise company, wise companions, that this person will be good in nature, self-mastered and protected by the virtues, 
continually living in righteous behavior, seeing danger in the smallest lapse of attention, undertaking the training in the virtues. Megiya, it can be expected of one with wise friends, wise, compa wise company, wise companions, that this person will go to those talks on the direct practice of the higher life, which lead to opening up the heart, to unfailing letting go, calming down, and Nibbana. Oops. Such talks one will have access, access to at will, without any trouble nor obstruction. Megiya, it can be expected of one with wise friends, wise company, or wise companions, that one will live determined and inspired for giving up unwholesome states of mind and the increase of wholesome ones with firm resolution and unflinching endurance in wholesome states. Megiya, it can be expected of one with wise friends, wise company, wise companions, that this person will be discerning, endowed with the wisdom that brings about the arising of happiness, the discernment of the aryas that brings about the complete end of trouble. Then, Megiya, one is firmly established in these five things. When one is firmly established in these five things, one should develop further in these four things. Unattractiveness should be cultivated to give up longing. Now, of course, here the Buddha is in fact really... <laughs> we see some smiles here, that's good. <laughs> there is um, this is a very um, condensed uh, the whole of the path really these five elements to begin with the wise wise company wise friendship or beautiful friendship which is called Kalyana Mitatta and by having this in the first place we can be expected to just practice the whole path because that's the, the condition, the cause for all of it to arise. And therefore, um, we will be able to also listen to these talks, to, to have access to that teaching, to, uh, to actually practice wholesome states and unwholesome, uh, abandoning unwholesome states and grow discernment. But now, there was also, and this sutta is quite wonderful for this because it really is, um, it really is a condensed version of, of everything that the Buddha taught, well, everything, of the most salient features of his teaching. And very often, um, the Buddha explained that some kinds of meditations also are useful to develop for certain kinds of mental states. And so here we have a little bit of an insight on what kind of meditations we can develop to overcome certain inclinations of our minds. Uh, some people, for example, have more tendency towards anger. Uh, that's the main thing that comes up. Or some people is mainly uh, like uh, longing for things or uh, food is a big hindrance or <laughs> things like that. Um, and there's different ways of working with this. And so he said also boundless love should be cultivated to give up resentment. It's not only good for that, but it works particularly well for, well, abandoning anger. Meditation using the breath as a reminder should be cultivate, 
cultivated to cut through thinking. And the perception of constant change should be cultivated to uproot personal pride. Now, these are the, I would say, the four main or the three first main um, ways of the, that the Buddha had to train um, or the monks train also. Whenever there's, a, for example, longing for food arising and there's just this really strong craving for food or a particular kind of cheesecake, for example, maybe some people <laughs> that's their hindrance and um, it comes up with like an ice cream on top and all these like chocolate things and and then they're really craving it <laughs> and their mind is obsessed by it well we can just simply there's all kinds of ways of practicing this uh, repulsiveness or unattractiveness and there's quite quite a big series uh, with uh, related to the body for example in the Satipatthana Sutta, which I'm not going to go into. But you can maybe think what it looks like when it's in your stomach, or <laughs> what it looks like uh, when you're done digesting it, for example, or something like that. And then, then sometimes we tend to lose this um, longing quite effectively. <laughs> And this, um, this can be quite um, effective for, um, you know, bodily attraction or things like that. That, that apparently seems to be a very uh, common hindrance, uh, especially in uh, uh, some kinds of uh, mental inclinations and some, some monks that... Uh, some stories about uh, that uh, being the main hindrance is uh, having the uh, the mind obsessed with the opposite gender, for example. Well, there the um, the Buddha describes many different ways that we can develop uh, certain understanding through developing understanding of un unattractiveness. In all kinds of ways uh, to um, to liberate the mind from these things, and so boundless love obviously is the opposite of anger, and therefore, as soon as we see anger arising, we can simply let that go and replace it by boundless love or forgiveness or compassion and that really changes it completely and as we do this uh, the mind starts changing and the breath as a reminder the anapanasati was uh, very well known or extolled by the buddha to be particularly uh, good at uh, cutting through uh, thoughts or mental uh, proliferations <laughs> and so these were the, the the types the kinds of meditations and their purposes and they're not really all you know confined to that very specific road but they are particularly helpful to um, move away from these unwholesome states. And now the fourth one, well, obviously, is the, the big <laughs> the big fireworks of, uh, of uh, letting go of this taking things personal all the time or this, this strong idea of I, which we slowly learn to dissolve and we slowly learn to dissolve all of our problems that come with it <laughs> because all problems are well just rooted upon i <laughs> so when that is when that gets um let go and calm down we we really quickly see that all of our problems kind of do the same so that's always good and and there's other suttas uh, explaining this quite wonderfully where the Buddha says, well, you could think that 
even if you uh, cultivate mental development to the point where you understand anatta, for example, there's no more uh, understanding of of the self. There's no more uh, taking the self as uh, so seriously and uh, breaking through that understanding. You could think that there would still be uh, problems and all these things, but he says no. There's there's only happiness. <laughs> there's only happiness and steady awareness because all these hindrances they're all rooted upon this I, and it doesn't mean that we stop living. It just means that we're just free, <laughs> and that. Um, these all these hindrances they don't have a ground to grow into so uh, many things could be said but this is uh, mainly it and Megiya for one who perceives constant change and that's anicca sanya things are just constantly changing uh, now I there is my blood has kind of went through my whole body how many times for the past, I don't know, five minutes. It's all been changing and all the blood cells have, you know, collected a little bit more oxygen and changed and did their chemical reactions. And I'm, I'm not doing any of that. I don't, I don't actually know how it works. <laughs> and it's all happening by itself. And it's always constantly changing. And how many, how many trillions of consciousnesses have arisen and passed away in the past two minutes that I just talked to you? Is it really, is it really me? <laughs> is it really, can I really claim this? I don't know. Can I, um, can I grasp at it? Not really. It's all it's all going. It's all it's already gone. As soon as we mention it, it's gone. All these words that I just said, they're not just just gone. So as uh, the more and more we cultivate this understanding that in fact everything is just is just flowing. There's this wonderful sutta where the Buddha says everything is burning monks <laughs> and it's true everything is on fire everything is burning it's just changing 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 it's never the same but it's the same enough so that we get tricked <laughs> so we're not um, I guess we're not like a jelly or water so there's some enough to stay <laughs> the body is uh, solid enough for us to uh, kind of get used to it enough but um, really it's just constantly changing and the more we go in the depth of the mind we really see more and more how even consciousness which we usually would associate the most with this I would be like I is that awareness well we get to really see it in fact as it breaks up and as it arises 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 and passes away and so we simply let go <laughs> and the thing is that it's not scary at all that it's not something it's in fact so liberating because finally we were free. It's like, oh, well, it's just, it's just happening. Great. <laughs> and then we can, in fact, be more and more happy, more and more content and just, okay, not taking things so seriously all the time and just enjoying, enjoying our practice and mental development and clear awareness. 
for one who perceives constant change. The perception of impersonality comes to be integrated because that's always what happens when we cultivate anicca sanya, things are going. We cannot hold on to it and we cannot attach a sense of I to it because it's just going. And so it, that this is how anicca and anatta come together. One who becomes aware of the lack of a self directly uproots personal pride and attains Nibbana here and now. So that's fairly easy. Then, <laughs> you know what to do now. <laughs> no need for retreats or anything. <laughs> then, having understood the import of this, the Awakened One let out this uplifted revelation. Coarse thoughts and fine thoughts, excitement that surfaces in the mind, lacking understanding of these mental meanderings. One runs from one life to the next with a swirling mind. But understanding the meandering nature of the mind, the one who is intent masters them by awareness. That excitement that surfaces in the mind, that the Buddha has completely given up. And this ends quite wonderfully on this. We can maybe even try to imagine having a mind of the Buddha <laughs> and how, how that must feel to be completely beyond thinking or any kind of mental agitation or mental propagation or proliferation, having this completely clear, liberated mind that is resting in complete openness and happiness. And on this, well, this is, this is what I wish for you in, in your life, in your upcoming whatever you're going to do, wherever you are on the path, it's always, it, the Dhamma is always a good place to be. So wherever you are, you're at the right place. And you can only get, get better all the time. <laughs> so that's, it's, there's no, um, we, we learn, we get, we we apply the things that we learn and then this is how we learn continually and so many things so many insights happen in fact after the retreat when we've got all this stuff in our head now <laughs> well hopefully more more less stuff than more stuff but <laughs> Um, and then we, we come into contact with our, <laughs> our life again, <laughs> or whatever we, we call life, or whatever activities we, we come back to. And then that, that's when this contact, this is when there's a lot of insights that arise from being in retreat, doing all these things, and then we get to integrate and see, oh... All these things happen and in fact it gets to be very interesting and so much of this practice that we've we've been talking about here and practicing is very easy to integrate to life and you might not you might not be able to you know sit for five hours and that's really normal. Of course, this is a retreat, so that's why it's called a retreat. <laughs> but um, you might not get to that deep, deep place that you get on retreat, but every retreat is like that. Though, it will be interesting to integrate and you know, practicing metta, for example, is completely possible during 
everything that we do. The Buddha didn't teach sitting meditation. He said, Titang Charang Nisino Wa. Standing, walking, Titang, standing. These are the same root, in fact, just to say, stand, st, and is the same root uh, in Sanskrit. So, Titang, but Pali is a little bit different. <laughs> Titan charang and walking, doing everything is the same. Is no, we don't, and that will collect the mind. It will keep the mind in this very wonderful place. And you've done a lot of work, everybody here. You've done a lot of work, and I believe that pretty much everybody, everybody here can experience that I think all the time and um, interestingly to see how how we can bring this practice into the life the life environment and the more we do that in fact the more when we get to sit that's where the real difference is it's not the sitting. It's when we actually do, we keep practicing, we keep sending metta, we keep having compassion all the time. When we sit, then we're right there. And being, of course, being practicing generosity, we have, um, we've learned so many ways of um, how this works and in fact, we've learned in this wonderful sitta that the highest generosity is not to give 84,000 golden bowls filled with silver and 84,000 silver bowls filled with gold and 84,000 elephants with golden nettings and golden flags and all these things. We learned that to uh, feed one person with a wise understanding is more meritorious than this. We've learned that Holding just the virtue is more meritorious than feeding a Buddha. <laughs> and we've learned that practicing metta for just about uh, the time it takes to notice a smell is more meritorious than all of it. For, for just this brief amount of time. So when we talk about generosity, we don't talk about, you know, like, oh, give money to, I don't know, to, uh, oh, give money to the Sangha <laughs> or something like that. It's actually, it's actually practicing. Practicing is the highest gift that you can give to the world. That, that's just so clear, so simple. Practicing metta, there's nothing very very there's one thing that the buddha said in that sutta that is higher and it's to see impermanence but you can just do both <laughs> so you're so you're safe <laughs> that i recommend <laughs> just see metta is impermanent so you're safe you're you're doing pretty good <laughs> actually there are suttas where the buddha is explaining this and so if you do that, you're, you're set. And that's the highest generosity. And, um, and uh, I like to say also, because generosity, is, it is important. Like, and I want to, <laughs> I like people to understand it in the right way, not thinking that I uh, am trying to like <laughs> get something out of people. But it, it's more, it's really... It's helping. Generosity is helping also. It's like when, when someone's in need or whatever, whatever it is, uh, it's helping and see how that feels. He, see, how, see how you feel after you gave that, that buck to that homeless person or whatever, whatever it is. And uh, when I first got uh, to the Kootenays, in Nelson uh, and I was going for alms and I I really didn't you know I didn't 
Well, first, I didn't really have any uh, big expectations for uh, for Holmes because I thought, well, uh, and I soon discovered that I could just walk and walk around uh, town the whole day, and I wouldn't get like I wouldn't get food. People would wouldn't even people at best would think it was a singing bowl, <laughs> so. <laughs> Or maybe a kettle drum. So uh, putting food in is not not even a question. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so so of course I went I went to uh, you know I went to a lot of food banks and um, because that is something that monks did also uh, in in the past where people when there's it's not really in the culture for example or things like that we can go to these food banks for example. And it's it's given, it's offered, and uh, and the 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 people working there and the people who are uh, giving is always um, well. From what I saw, they were always really happy. <laughs> they were always really happy to just like take that spoonful of food and just put it in your plate and they're just like always smiling I can't remember one not smiling and uh, what they're they were doing is is you know it's is um, you know do doing this act of really helping they they knew that it felt good and they and the the people they were actually grateful and so there was just this really wonderful connection to see where there's this just this really truthful feeling of of goodness and just there's no money involved there's just you know just here have food eat and they were so happy to do it and there is and that's that's one example but there's so many ways of doing that and there this is such a wonderful place to draw happiness from and it's endless. You can get creative with it, <laughs> and um, and many many of you. I mean, I'm saying this, and I I already know. I've I've seen your generosity in action. So I just I can only encourage it and uh, see see how the mind feels afterwards it is free it is liberated it is right there it is uplifted and that's the goal that's the the whole point and the more we do it the easier the meditation becomes it's good it's so good we just sit we're right there so this is the one of the most beautiful, I think, uh, aspect of the Buddha's teaching is this constant reminder of doing good, doing good deeds, uh, doing, it is said merit, meritorious deeds, but acts of goodness, random acts of kindness all the time. And that is... Personally, that's one thing that drew me to, to this teaching. But I thought this was so beautiful. How, you know, oh, actually, I don't actually need a reason. <laughs> I can just, why don't I just do good actions? <laughs> this is the first time I heard that. And I was like, whoa, that's a novelty. <laughs> so... I think that's quite that's quite beautiful and um, yes I can only recommend that so on this I will just let you go or unless there was questions but I don't I don't know <laughs> and I don't have a question but I did have a comment and that's that um, I think we uh, maybe speak for the others too, but we can see your generosity and in leading this retreat and taking care of us. Um, for myself, I know that's been super, super helpful. 
And so thank you for your generosity. So much work. Sad, sad. Well, you all very easy students. <laughs> very, very good, good people. So sadu, sadu, sadu. Mm. Good. So well, on this, um, we can share some merits and um, we will have this uh, real, I think a few, few more people will uh, make an effort, our international Sangha will make an effort to join, I think, tomorrow morning, I think. <laughs> and um, we will have a more uh, official uh, kind of a general merit sharing for the whole retreat and because of course so many people are supporting this all these conditions so we we will uh, really um, underline that and honor that uh, tomorrow uh, on a light note so okay here we are so let's share our merits and then well just continue to be happy i guess dukha patta chani dukha bhaya patta chani bhaya sokha patta chani sokha hondu sabbe vipani no Hirang no punyang sabhe satta nu mudantu sabba sampatti siddhiya aga satta jabu matta deva naga mahidika punyang tanga nu moritva chirang rakhantu buddha sasasana May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha-sasana, sadhu, sadhu.